Welcome everyone, welcome to our online viewers and our church members, thank you for joining our worship service today. We are happy to have you with us and we look forward to having you each week. Our series has at heart the youth who may be struggling with the question, does God still love me regardless of how I identify myself? This question can cause confusion within our youths, hence the title, Confused, Why Are You So Confused? We, the leadership team, feel it is important to start having open conversations about sexuality, both at home and in the church. This month's programme aims to educate youths, parents and the church of the social issues the youths are facing. We want the youths to know that they are not alone and that the church and Jesus loves them. I'd like to introduce our speaker for the hour, Pastor Micah Campbell. He's serving at Wensbury, uh, West Bromwich and the New Life SDA churches. Pastor. Campbell is a motivational speaker. He does one minute boost videos on social media. He is passionate about introducing youths to Jesus. The message he will deliver to us today will be sent with encouragement and love. I have some words of encouragement before we pray. 
it is inspired by Psalms th verse 30, chapter 37, verses 10 and 11, and it says, when you have problems, remember the, the Bible's words, it came to pass, not to stay, hang in there, a new dawn is, a new dawn, a new day is dawning. We will now have a prayer by Elder Lawrence, followed with a special song, after which Pastor Campbell will speak and close in prayer. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon all and happy Sabbath. Uh, let us bow our heads. Um, for those of us who can kneel and would like to kneel, please feel free to do so as uh, we pray and seek the Lord's uh, blessings and his guidance. Let us pray. Kind, merciful, heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for sparing our lives to see yet another Sabbath day. Father, I ask that you will accept the worship and praise that we bring. We ask, dear Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins uh, forgive us of anything that we have done that is unlike you. Help us, dear Father, as we desire to know more about you, that you will uh, give us more of your understanding. We ask, dear Lord, that you will give us more of the Holy Spirit, that he will guide us into all truth. Lord, at this time, we ask that you will be with those who are sick, those who are poor, those who are in need. We ask, dear Lord, that you will remember um, family members of ours that are really, really sick at this time, as we pray for uh, Pastor McIntosh and his family. We pray that you will uh, stretch forth your hand of healing to heal, to comfort, and to guide. Lord, we ask that you will uh, supply the needs of others. And where possible, Lord, use us, your people, to supply those needs. Father, I pray that you will be with um, the Bilston members and the Bilston congregation. Father, you see the uh, topics that we have uh, highlighted and outlined for this month. Lord, we are trying to uh, reach out to uh, people who uh, have questions um, that they haven't had answered. But Lord, we know ultimately that you are a God of love and you love us uh, no matter what. Lord, I ask and pray that you will be with our church leaders. Uh, give them the vision, give them the strength, uh, to keep going from day to day. I also pray, dear Lord, that you will be with the world leaders, uh, that the freedom that we still have at this time to worship you, that this may continue. Lord, we know that uh, you raise up rulers and kings for, for your purposes. So, dear Lord, we take this moment, Lord, to give you thanks and praise. Father, I ask, Lord, that um, you will open our eyes that we may see more of you in the things around us, in nature, and not to be distracted by um, the adversary or distracted by things that are going on in the world. Help us, dear Lord, to keep our minds stayed and focused on you. And at this time, Lord, we like to hold up the minister, um, Pastor Micah, to before you. We pray, dear Lord, that as he speaks and as he delivers your word, that we not only see him, but we can see the love of God and we can see Christ in all that he is delivering and preaching to us. Uh, thank you again for this Sabbath day, Lord, and we pray that uh, you will show us truly how to uh, rest in this, your 
the, the day that you have sanctified for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How I love to tell the story of God's redemption plan. How Jesus died to take my sins away. But my finest words cannot express what one old rugged tree said best for nails to it was all God had to say the cross said it's all the cross said it's all without a word God's heart was hurt for the cross and it's all to prove his love like nothing else could. God used three names and two pieces of wood as the cross said it's all. He could write it in the heavens or he could spell it in the stars. He could even paint it across the sky for all to see. But with his own love, Jesus Christ wrote I love you with his life and forgiveness still resounds from Calvary the cross said it's all the cross said it's all God's heart was hurt for the cross said it's all to prove his love like nothing else could God used three cross and two pieces of wood and the cross and the It's more than a symbol of suffering or a picture of pain and agony. For there at the cross, every soul that was lost found a breath. 
Happy Sabbath, everybody. I want to take this opportunity to say the singing was beautiful. What a lovely song. I also want to take this opportunity to wish you in your homes um, a very, very warm, wonderful, happy Sabbath. I want to take this time to acknowledge uh, your senior minister, and I thank him for sharing the pulpit with me today, Pastor Dan Mahadukan. I also want to take this time to, to ask you to pray for his family. May God continue to lead him as he ministers to your church. I want to also acknowledge Uncle Herbie, Dr. Griffiths. You know, it's great to, to see you on this platform. May God bless you in your ministry. And thank you for the support that you have given me continually throughout my ministerial experience. Way back when I, I decided to go to New Bold and even to this very day, may God truly bless you. I want to say good morning and happy Sabbath to the elders. Also to Horatio, God bless you, my friend. And of course, to Marla, thank you so much for the correspondence we've had and the opportunities we've had to talk in relation to this wonderful program. God bless you all in your homes. I also want to ask God to bless those who may be watching or streaming or, or, or watching this in a different country. God bless you and happy Sabbath. The title of my sermon today is You're Cheating Yourself. You're Cheating Yourself. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. That's 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. This is what the Word of God says. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Who once were not a, a people, but now are a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, have ha, having your contact honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. The title of my sermon once more is You Are Cheating Yourself. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father God, I ask that you forgive me for my sins. I pray that you speak through me. And as we deal with a really difficult topic today, I pray that your name may be glorified and that people may hear exactly what you want them to understand about sexual purity. We thank you so much, Lord, and we love you so deeply. Amen. I read an article and, in fact, watched a documentary some time ago about a young lady called Danielle Williams. Danielle Williams was a young lady who, who decided to leave her family home and ended up stripping. She ended up on a stripper pole making loads and loads of money, more money than she could ever imagine. As time progressed, she decided that stripping wasn't enough. You see, stripping gave her money and it gave her accolade and it made her feel nice when she put those clear heels on and she spun around that pole. But the biggest problem was it didn't fund the lifestyle that she wanted there was still an empty void in Danielle's life. And so she decided to move on from stripping and found herself in the adult entertainment industry. You know what I'm talking about, right? And she decided to go about doing movies because movies made her feel special. You see, on set, everybody was seen as beautiful. On set, it didn't, make, it didn't matter what she looked like when she got there. It mattered what she looked like when she was on the camera. They did her hair and her nails and her makeup, and they gave her clothes to wear, and she said that she felt really, really attractive. But it still didn't fill the void because something was missing. 
Each night she would come home after being on set. And, and while I spare you the gory details, I can say that she suffered pain internally, physically, and mental anguish from the stuff that she did because nothing seemed to soothe the wounds of what she had been through. You see, many people in this day and age look to things in the media, especially the adult entertainment industry, and they think that it, it they think that it's reality, but in fact, it's not reality, but it's acting. There are many people who have left their homes and found themselves in the adult entertainment industry, hoping for a better life, hoping for more money, hoping for some accolade and fame. But the reality is it never quite meets their needs because something always is missing. You know, Paul spoke about uh, us having bodies which are supposed to be temples of the Holy Spirit. Peter spoke about it's important for us to understand as believers that we are different. And so the question I've often asked myself is what makes us different from the world? What makes us different from the pleasures that we see in the world? When there are people who are leaving their family homes to shoot movies, to make loads and loads of money, and they still feel empty, what is it that they are looking for and searching for? I realize that we live in a time in society where there is so much sex in the industry and in the media that it becomes painfully uncomfortable sometimes when you're sitting with your children watching TV because even the very children programs are filled with so many innuendos that you actually think to yourself, are my children really seeing what they are seeing? Then we talk about schools, a place where children are supposed to be educated and we have to sometimes uneducate them or re-educate them when they come home because their minds are bombarded with things that you know aren't good for them. Times now, sex education used to be about a man and a woman. It used to be about more reproduction than actually the act. In school, sex education came under, like, biology lesson. It wasn't PSAT or anything like that. It was part of a biology lesson. And what the teachers would do is they would explain to you the mechanics of how it works in relation to reproduction. And now children are given choices in school. Children are told that it doesn't matter if you have two moms or two dads. It's okay if you end up, you know, being gender fluid or gender neutral or pansexual. It doesn't really matter what you do as long as you are happy. We live in a world, brothers and sisters, where it's all about hedonism. Whatever feels good, do it. And this is the problem. When we are in a world as Christians and we are told to be peculiar or different, but we're filled in a world where sex is pushed in our faces. It becomes sometimes really difficult for us to evangelize to people about purity because we, in effect, seem weird and different. Now kids are told in school that it's okay to be LBGTQO or plus. You know, you can be gender fluid. One day you can be bisexual. Next day you can be pansexual. Next day you can be homosexual. And you can work your way back to being heterosexual if you want to. And I don't say this with any disrespect to anybody. Because I think sexual orientation is really important. But I think it's also important for us to understand where this whole thing comes from. You see, sexual orientation is a construct of the media. If you go back to the Bible, these things did happen, of course, in places like Sodom and Gomorrah. And throughout biblical passages, you found out, find out that homosexuality, can, homosexuality existed back in biblical times, as it does now. And God doesn't condemn the person. He condemns the sin. And I want to make this really clear so no one feels as though they are being judged, marginalized, or treated badly because of this. But I want to to make this clear that this was never God's ideal. You see, God's ideal, when we go back into Genesis, was for Adam and Eve to get married and for them to have a family and for them to reproduce. If a person is in a homosexual relationship, there is never a, going to be any reproduction. It's just impossible. 
It's not what God ordained or God ever wanted to happen. We live in a society now where this is seen as the norm. Like I have to be careful and choose my words carefully about what I say lest I offend someone or somebody wants to sue me for speaking out against someone's sexual orientation. Now, so what does this all have to do with you and with me and with us? Well, put it this way. When your children go to school, and I have young kids, when your children go to school, and they sit in class, their teachers can teach them whatever they want them to hear. That means all of the hard work that you have done in instilling Christian values will be undone when they go to school. And that means when they come back from school, you then have to re-educate your children to remind them the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, black and white. But the reality is, it's a constant battle because you're battling with the primary agent of socialization, which is seen to be schools and colleges and universities. I mean, they spend six hours in school and they spend a few hours in the evening before they go to bed. So all of that stuff they learn in school is embedded into their mind. This is why we have to pray over our children and ask the Holy Spirit to intercede on their behalf, that he may work within their hearts enabling them to understand and decipher the difference between right and wrong. You see, the world now just wants us to do whatever feels good. And this is why homosexuality is so fashionable or being bisexual is fashionable. Let's look at this carefully. I remember reading an article about Jessie J. Jessie J said at one stage that she was bisexual. Okay, we accept Jessie J how she is. We accept her. Still love her in Jesus. Then Jesse J came out later and said, you know, it was just a phase. I actually really want to have a heterosexual relationship now and I want to have a family. And she was slated by people. The LBGTQO plus community slated her. They said that Jesse J was making a mockery of what it meant to be bisexual by saying it was just a phase. The reality is it's seen as fashionable. If you say you're bisexual and you are in the music industry, do you know what happens? Your music begins to sell more. If you say that you are homosexual and you are an actor, you, you, you earn more money and you find better opportunities. If you say you're a homosexual and you end up presenting in the medium, you end up with more gigs and more opportunities. Why? Because it's now seen as fashionable. Let's look at Black Lives Matter on my list. And I'm an advocate of black lives. Yeah, I'm an advocate of black lives. But when you go to Black Lives Matter, the organization in itself, the organization wants to defund the police or debunk the system of the police. It also wants to completely ruin the ideology of the nuclear family. It wants to ruin that completely and instead give an opportunity for people to recognize that a family no longer has to consist of a man and a woman and children, but can consist of whatever you want it to be. Two men, two women. Three women, one man. Two men, one woman. Whatever you want it to be can now be the norm because homosexuality is now twinned with racism. So if you speak against somebody who is a homosexual, you are as guilty as being racist. See the world we live in now? Confused, right? I remember there was a song by an artist called T-Pain. I don't know if you heard of T-Pain. T-Pain had a song called My Girlfriend's Got a Girlfriend. I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying here. T-Pain had a song entitled My Girlfriend's Got a Girlfriend. And these are some of the lyrics to the song. I'm not trying to tell you to go and buy the music. I'm just here giving you an illustration, okay? You with me? This is one of his songs. In his song in particular, the lyrics go like this. My girlfriend got a girlfriend. I just found out. But it's all right as long as I can be with her too. My girlfriend's got a girlfriend. It really is no problem because I'm going to make it do what I want to. Because having two chicks is better than no chicks. I'd rather just join in, keep my girl, and keep the other one too. My girlfriend's got a girlfriend. I haven't, I've never listened to the song. Just in my research, I found these lyrics, and I thought I'd add them to the sermon, okay? 
the thing is, I felt a little uncomfortable reading those lyrics because what T-Pain does is he normalizes this idea of bringing another entity into your marriage. The sanctity of marriage exists between two people and God. He's the only person that should be brought into a fabric of a relationship. But what T-Pain suggests is one of the things that has made his relationship with his wife strong is the fact that they are experimenting and bringing other people into the relationship. <clears throat> the question is, would he be okay for another man to come into the relationship? And of course, his response is definitely not. But would he be okay for another woman? Yes. In an interview, he said that he had been with his wife at the time for 13 years. And the question was, what, T-Pain, what makes your relationship strong? And he says, one of the things that makes our relationship strong is the fact that my wife is happy for us to go to the strip club, for, for me to choose a woman. And if she likes that woman, we can bring her back home and have fun with her. Brothers and sisters, I have a problem with this. You see, the only person that I want to lay with my wife is me. Are you hearing me? The only person that my wife should lay with is me. If there are other people in our marriage or in the fabric of our relationship, then there automatically is a problem because God did not ordain this. We live in a world now where when we look at the, at the reading, at the the teachings of Peter back in that passage that I, I mentioned, and I'll go back there right now, 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation. That means God has handpicked you and selected you for his purpose. You are a royal priesthood, which basically means that you are from the, from the priestly line and you are seen as holy, acceptable in God and special. You are a holy nation, meaning that you yourself are imbued with righteousness, which comes from God, washed clean and made close in the image of God. His own special people referring to the fact that there is something different about you. You are something that I love, care for, and I die for you because I want you to experience in complete, complete pleasure and eternal life. You yourself and, and your purpose is to proclaim the praises of God that has called you out of darkness and into this marvelous light. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world which is so dark that what's right seems uncomfortable and what's wrong seems peculiar. We live in a world where we can't speak about certain things lest people say we're judgmental or narrow-minded or we look at things black and white. Brothers and sisters, the gray area has expanded so big right now that there's so much confusion for our young people that they grow up not knowing what life should be like, but seem to wing it and make mistakes along the way, hoping that one day they're getting okay. Verse 10 says, once you were not a people, but are now my people. And it talks about this whole experience of, of, of receiving mercy. Mercy or, or unmerited favor is normally given by God to us based on his goodness for his children. God himself understands that once we were walking in darkness, confused about loads of different things, but he has brought us back to him because he recognizes that we are special, worthy of death, but worthy of salvation. Special. Because even in the midst of our earthly confusion, God wants to give us a clean, clear path to him. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners or travelers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We live in a world, brothers and sisters, listen to this carefully, where lust is no longer seen as lust. Bad people don't really talk about lust and sexual sin. It's just now you just want to do it, do it. You know, during lockdown it was difficult for some people because they couldn't meet up. That's why they came up with even more uh, dating apps during lockdown so that people could have cyber relationships. Because this day and age, people don't court or, or date like we do. The dating starts on your phone and it ends up in your bed. That's how it works in this day and age. I was talking to a friend of mine and I was asking, um, I was asking him, you know, how do you meet girls in this day and age? He's not married. And he was saying to me, listen, all I do is I go on Tinder, plenty of fish, and he gave me a whole long list of apps I hadn't even heard of. And he said, listen, 
I just chirps the girl, even forget that. I just slide into her DM, in case you're not familiar with what that means. I jump into, her, I, I send a message into her inbox on Instagram, and we just start dating by talking. And as I slide into her DM, we go back and forth, and that's really the first day. You know, we're talking and getting to know each other back and forth. And then we arrange a hookup or a meeting. I said, oh, okay, okay, you can buy dinner and flowers. No, no, we don't waste time with all that stuff. I just meet up with her and we smash and I go about my business. And I was like, that's how it is for you, just like that? He says, yeah. I said, are you safe? Are you clean? Are you safe? Yeah, sometimes. But sometimes in the heat of the moment, you don't care about that stuff, but you just go to the gum clinic and get sorted out. I'm sorry if some of you feel uncomfortable. This is the reality of what we're living in, guys. Like, 100%. Like, people don't care. People don't care. I remember back in the day, if you had, if a woman had a high body count, meaning if she had slept with loads and loads of partners, she was called all sorts of names, loose and whole and all sorts of things. Like, those things don't even exist anymore. Like, Cardi B has already squashed that. She's made it very clear, very clear that it's okay to have multiple partners. So has Nicki Minaj. It's all in the name. Nicki Minaj, Minaj a trois, meaning sexual intercourse with multiple partners. Like her and Cardi B, they've broken that down. If a woman sleeps with loads and loads of guys, it's okay. It's just part of the experience. Sex these days is like a handshake. It's like a greeting that people do when they get to know each other. And there's a problem because when they get married, they take that large body count into their marriage. And then when they're intimate with their spouse, it might not be as good as number 99 or 59 or 63 because there's something missing and there's no connection. Man, you're not hearing me. I spoke to one lady and she said that her body count was over 100. I said, okay, I don't judge you. thought to myself, Lord have mercy. She said, yeah, it was over 100, you know, but I enjoyed myself. I'm married now. I said, are you happily married? She said, yes, I am. I said, oh, good for you. Your husband must be special. Peter speaks, <laughs> Marley, you're making me laugh. Peter speaks about a tenor ratio. People speaks about, Peter speaks about abstaining from fleshly lust because he recognizes that we live in a world where this is the norm. Like I'm speaking to some of you and some of you look shocked or maybe a bit uncomfortable, but guys, this is the norm. Let me put this into context. My youngest child is four years old. When he's 18 years of, of age, this type of stuff that I'm saying to you is going to be ancient. I pray that God comes before he becomes 18 because I can't imagine the lifestyle that he'll be involved in or, 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 or that, may that may try to entice him or tempt him because things only seem to get worse. So why is sexual sin such an issue? You know, we don't really speak about it much in church. We're great with the Daniel and Revelation and with the prophecy and, and with all of that kind of stuff. And don't get me wrong, I love Daniel and Revelation and I love prophecy. And my brother mentioned this, um, Ortiz, in, in, in Sabbath school, and I was so blessed by what you said about a, a, count, a counselee, a client asking you to teach them stuff. May God truly bless you, my brother. And I'm not, and, and I, I don't have an issue with that stuff, but I also think that we have to face reality, brothers and sisters and also acknowledge that there are people within our churches that know Daniel and Revelation, but still struggle with sexual sin. And I think it's important for us to understand why there is a struggle. I'm not saying to you don't pray about this. I'm not saying to you don't fast. But I think it's also important to understand emotionally and physiologically what happens within your body, which makes you want to sleep with someone. Like these things are normal. If you don't, if you're never sexually aroused and stuff, then there is something wrong with you. You're not a human being living. These things are normal. But there's a way God wants us to, to act. Let's go to, let's, let, let's look at some facts there. So basically, this is one of the things. So one of the questions asked is, why is sexual sin such an issue? One of the reasons why it's such an issue is because there is a hormonal connection that takes place between the act of sexual intercourse and also the act of a hug. That 
hormone is called dopamine. Dopamine is that hormone that makes you feel good, especially in men during sexual intercourse. It makes them feel a high sense of arousal, arousal, sorry, a feeling of euphoria, even at its heightened stage reaching the big O. With women, the hormone involved with women, this hormone is involved, but also they also experience oxytocin, which is another hormone, a hormone so strong that it bonds someone like glue. Listen to this carefully. Oxytocin releases during sexual intercourse in men and women, but in higher levels in women. Higher levels in women. Watch this carefully. The problem is the body can't distinguish whether the person that you have slept with or are involved with sexually is a casual fling or marriage material. Your body can't distinguish the difference. Your mind can, but your body can't because oxytocin is released either way. This is why some people feel so miserable when they come out of long-term relationships or even short-term flings because their body has, has bonded them with someone through oxytocin. We're not even talking about spiritual stuff here. We're just talking about a physiological response that happens within the body. When a woman sleeps with a man, oxytocin is released. It bonds them like glue. This is why when someone has a high body count is sometimes so hard for them to move on because they have bonded themselves with loads of different people like glue. I ain't even talking about the spiritual stuff. I'm just talking about the physiological stuff right here. You with me? Now, men, on the other hand, instead of getting a, a Instead of getting a surge of the bonding hormone, hormone they receive a, a large amount of the pleasure hormone, dopamine. This is why it's easier for men to sleep around and move on. Because as far as they're concerned, they got their release. They got their dopamine. You get dopamine when you go to Alton Towers and go on those rides. You get dopamine when you lift weights in the gym. You with me? You get dopamine when you run a marathon. You get dopamine when you hug someone you love. And as soon as that's finished, you can walk on by and act like nothing's ever happened. This is why, brothers, let me talk to the men here. We need to make sure that we treat our women with respect. And we also need to make sure that we educate our daughters and the women within our churches, family groups and communities so that they can understand how important this thing is. This thing is serious, you know, and it's not something to be thrown around frivolously. Why have I mentioned all of this stuff? I've mentioned this stuff for a reason. You see, when you look at the passage in the Bible that I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, which is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20, Paul speaks about sexual intimacy and issues surrounding this. In verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price and therefore glorify God with your body. The reason why Paul mentioned this passage isn't to talk about your body being a temple so you must go to the gym frequently, or isn't talking about you must be a vegan because your body is the temple. You know, we often use that passage to, to illustrate loads and loads of things. But if you read it in the context, Paul is speaking about sexual purity. Temples should never be defiled. Temples always looked beautiful in the inside, more beautiful in, 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 in Israeli um, communities, more than the outside. The outside looked spectacular, but the inside had to be beautiful. When you read the uh, uh, Songs of Solomon, you read about Solomon himself. Solomon likens his woman to a temple, beautiful, decorated, adorned, made precious, made holy. Solomon himself rebuilt the temple and used the finest precious materials he could find because it was supposed to be a place dedicated to worshiping God. If our bodies are a temple, then the outside should look nice. 
but the inside should look even more beautiful. Because if God really is going to dwell in our hearts, then we have to pray and ask him to remove from, from, from us things that are causing us damage. Some of the things in our lives that we watch are causing us damage. Some of the music we listen to is causing us damage. The programs we watch is causing us damage. The conversations we have are causing us damage. Damage and God wants us to guard the avenues of our mind to be careful with the things that we watch, the things that we listen to, because some of that is causing us damage. It's like when you even listen to some of the cultural music we like, we have to be careful with the artists we listen to because there's some of the music is so provocative that it causes us damage. It stays in our minds. Are you hearing me? A temple is a place that should be dedicated to worship and praise, adoration and honor and sacrifice. Listen to this carefully. A temple is a place that should be dedicated for worship and praise, point one. Point two, adoration and honor. And point three, sacrifice. Once more, worship and praise, adoration and honor and sacrifice. If my body is the living temple of God, I have to be having daily devotion with God daily. I have to spend my time in his word, time glorifying his name, time praising him for the good and the bad, time worshiping him on my knees, time reading his word. I can't do those things and go look at porn. It doesn't work like that. There has to be a change that happens within us if we truly want to get closer to God. The second thing is we have to be asking God to help us to adore his name. Place his name higher than any other name. Place his name greater than any other name. Ensure that he is the forefront of our mind, even intertwined with our thoughts and our actions. And that only happens by us spending time with him, devoted and set aside for him. The last thing is sacrifice. Sacrifice is the hardest thing. And while we're on the topic of like sexual sin and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff, you know, sacrifice is really hard. Because to sacrifice ourselves while alive means that we live a life where we are constantly saying to God, not your will, not my will, but yours. A life of sacrifice means that the very things I want to do, I'm not going to do because it defiles your temple. The things that I want to watch, I can't watch because it defiles your temple. The things I want to say, I can't say because it defiles your temple. The things I want to be or experiences I want to have, I can't have because it defiles your temple. There has to be an attitude within our hearts of saying to ourselves, I can't do these things. Although I may want to, I can't. Because, Lord, it defiles your temple. And so the temple was a place with beautiful decadence, a place filled with magnificent splendor and opulence, a building for the community with total relevance, where the Lord would be glorified with complete benevolence and people would come to worship him in complete reverence as they would search the truth, looking for divine evidence. This is what the temple of God is supposed to be all about. We have issues, brothers and sisters, because we know all this stuff. I ain't preaching to you something you haven't heard before, but we still live in a world which is so marred. Now, this afternoon, we'll go into some practical things that we can do to help people who may be struggling with sexual addiction and things like that. But one of the biggest and most important things is prayer. But prayer without works is dead. We have to be willing to do something about it. We can't just be saying, yeah, I'm going to pray about it every day and continue sinning. There has to be something within our hearts that says, Lord, although I struggle with these things, I lay them at your feet and want you to surround me with people that can help me. This is why there are AA meetings, addiction, addiction anonymous meetings to help people within groups when they are struggling. 
This is why they are counselors to help people who are struggling. This is why they are filtering software that can be put on computers and phone devices and like-minded tablets to prevent you from slipping up and making mistakes because we live in a world where it's bombarded in our faces. So no wonder why young people struggle with this and older people too, because it's pushed in your face. You struggle with temptations when it's pushed in your face, but find deliverance with God when we're in enveloped around his grace. I started off talking about a lady in my story when I started called Danielle Williams. Her name now is Danielle Williams McCord. Let me tell you a bit about Danielle Williams. Danielle Williams found herself in the adult entertainment industry, the pornography industry. She found herself, as I mentioned, working as a stripper. Then she basically started off shooting adult films and she did this looking to fill an empty void. She expressed that she also tried uh, uh, dating a woman and had a relationship with a woman for many years, but something still did not feel right. The question was asked of why she found herself in that path and, and, and what happened along the journey. With tears in her eyes, if Danielle spoke about being eight years old and, and, and molested. She explained, explained, sorry, that during that time, her whole life shattered. And, and, and part of her thought to herself, is this correct behavior? The guy that did this to me told me to shut my mouth, not to say anything. Maybe the problem is me. He says that he loves me, but I was a kid. I was only eight years old, she said. She explained that it was a neighbor who was a family friend who used to invite her over to his house. And as a child, she went over his house and would play in his garden and play in his house and then go back home. And he built up trust with this girl and trust with her family. As the trust began, he asked her to keep secrets for him and would give her things to return back to him. And, and the trust continued. This is what we call grooming, brothers and sisters. As time progressed and time went on, trust built between the two of them. And he asked her one day if he could hug her. And he began to hug her and then began to touch her. And she felt uncomfortable because she knew it was wrong. But something within her made her keep going back to him because as far as she was concerned, this man trusted her. She explained that he, she was molested by this man for many, many years. Then at the age of 10, her biological father tried to kill her. At the age of 14, a uh, she went to church and a choir member introduced her into a lifestyle that made her go to the wrong path. She explained that at 14, she started stripping. That's right, 14, she became a stripper. At 18, she shot porn films. She explained that she lived in a completely dysfunctional house and she found herself traveling from place to place. She explained that she found herself in the adult industry and she explained that the experience was painful beyond belief. She expressed that all of those things that you see in a film are, are, are heavily edited, where the girls are, 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 are plastered with alcohol and drugs to make them seem more pliable. But, but, but the scene itself that may last for 20 minutes takes hours to film. She expressed that sometimes she'd be on set filming one scene for three, four hours. She explained that her whole insides felt like they were being torn apart. She said she was physically broken, emotionally broken, spiritually broken. And she went through all of this stuff because she believed that she had no self-worth. Her breaking point came when she traveled to New York and found herself with a friend who later became a pimp. And this pimp abused her in loads of ways that I won't even say in today's sermon. She explained that she prayed to God and said, Lord, if you rescue me from this situation, I will serve you. During a terrible ordeal, she was locked in the basement of his house for three whole weeks, beaten, abused, and other things. She expressed, expressed that one day she was crying loudly in that basement of that, L, of that New York, sorry, apartment, and somebody heard her cry, called the authorities and rescued her. 
She explained that after that experience, she decided to turn her life over to God. She believed that there was nothing that could fill her like Jesus. The things that she had been through had ruined her life, but Jesus had given her a second chance. She wrote a book entitled From Porn to the Pulpit and prayed that her message would help. She later went to Bible school and became an evangelist and had a a ministry entitled the No Judgment Zone, where people share their stories about their past and explain how God has helped them throughout their life. You see, brothers and sisters, I share this story with you to illustrate a point that God can rescue you in the midst of what you are going through. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, whether you struggle with sexual sin or know somebody who is struggling with sexual sin, God can rescue you. Whether you know somebody who is broken based on something they've been through, maybe they've had loads of frivolous relationships and they are broken and just want peace, God can rescue them. Maybe you want to pray over your children or grandchildren and they don't find themselves wrapped up in sexual sin and I want you to know that God can rescue them. Because brothers and sisters, we are living in the last days. And Christ Jesus wants to come. God forbid anybody lose their salvation because they were wrapped up in something they didn't believe that Jesus could save them from. Jesus wants to rescue you. But some of us are cheating ourselves. Jesus wants to save you. But some of us are lying to ourselves. Jesus wants to, to rescue you, to glorify him face to face. But some of us don't believe that he has the power to do so. Unless you believe, unless you accept, unless you acknowledge, unless you cry out to God for freedom, for strength, for help, for restoration, to save someone you love, unless you do these things, this will just be another sermon, one that you've heard before and one that has no change. So what change will happen in our lives today? I know all of us have homework to do. There are people within our family groups that are struggling with something that I've mentioned in this summer. People in our churches who are struggling with something that's been mentioned in this summer. People in our friendship groups who are struggling with something I've mentioned in this summer. People themselves who may be struggling with something I've mentioned in this summer. And I want you to know that you're not alone. Because God wants you not to stop fighting because he wants to carry you through this battle. He wants to strengthen you in the midst of what you go through. He wants to set your feet on high. He wants to remind you that although you may have had a bad past, there is a present future that awaits every single person who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And it starts with us saying right now, Lord, I need your help. I need your help, Jesus, because I don't want to cheat myself out of the kingdom. I don't want anyone else to cheat themselves out of the kingdom. I want you, Jesus, to use me as an anchor to bring people to you. Help us to heal together. Help us to fix that which is broken together. And help us to find peace and restoration in you together. You've heard the sermon and you just want to say, Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to help me. I need you to rescue me. And I need you to keep me pure for you. If you feel this way, just raise your hand. I need you to rescue me. I need you to keep me pure for you. Pure in thought, pure in action, pure in behavior. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you so much for what you will continue to do. We pray, Jesus, that you will help us to stay pure for you. Pure in every way, every shape, every form. Help our thoughts to be godly. Help the music we listen to to be uplifted. May the things that we watch be uplifted. May the conversations that we have be wholesome. And Lord Jesus, for people on this platform who are struggling with 
pornography or or struggling with things of that nature, struggling with sexual identity, struggling, struggling with sexual abuse, struggling with historical abuse. For people who are struggling with these things, may you help them to reach out to someone, Lord. Help them to reach out to a counselor, someone who can really help them, Jesus, through what they're going through. Help them, Jesus, to reach out to a pastor or a, or a friend or someone who can be confidential, who can help them and guide them the correct way. Help them to find restoration in you, Lord, purity in you. And please help us all to guard the avenues of our soul. You're coming again soon, Jesus, and we long to be ready for you. So forgive us for our sins and bless us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a i mm-hmm.
Amen. God has to thank Michael very much. Amen. Can I see the screen, please, Karen? So, but a bit of. Okay, thank you. Yes, I can see it now. Somehow my screen went. Right, I just want to say thank you to Micah. You know, that was a powerful, powerful, and I repeat, powerful sermon. Is there anyone, is there anyone here that did not get something from it? Oh, that's good. Everyone got something from it. And you know something, brethren? He will be back this afternoon. Yes. 